excited to be here. Actually, I had other plans uh, about, about taking the stage, but I didn't, uh, uh, I was not prepared to the fact that I will have a doctor in front of me. Um, so, Dr. J, great talk, by the way, Jennifer. Um, so, while she was talking, I, I thought, I kind of uh, encouraged myself saying, okay, she's Dr. J, I'm Dr. J Frog, and I, <laughs> I prepared myself uh, to, this, to, this, uh, to this challenge. And then, Igor, this unfair, um, rub it out of your, out of your head with, with her daughter. That was amazing. So uh, I don't have my daughters here with me. Um, but I will try to share with you why we at uh, JFrog think that by 2020, all companies will be a DevOps companies. So before I start, how many of you are familiar with JFrog? Wow. Tali, take a picture of that. that that's amazing. <laughs> um, we, we are here um, only, uh, this is my fourth day in Australia. We started two days in, in Sydney meeting our customers, and now here in Melbourne, and it's awesome, and everything that you learn about Australia since you are a kid is kangaroos and koalas and, and all kind of things, but you know what, uh, what happened to me when uh, yesterday we, we got on board the Qantas airline aircraft and I saw this giant kangaroo on the, on the aircraft tail. I realized that most of the time I'm getting these questions of uh, why JFrog? Why, why you named the company JFrog? And, and we always said that, you know, it's a cute animal, we like it. It's agile. It can only leap forward, and this is how we see JFrog. And then I realized that there is another animal which represents something bigger, and it's agile, and it's cute, and it even have a pocket that carries a baby. <laughs> Actually, it's a living repository. <laughs> and uh, ten, 10 years ago, if I would think about that, uh, I would call it J Kangaroo, but... Uh, <laughs> But anyway, I'm, I'm very, very grateful to be here and, and happy to leap forward with you. So, um, you know, after this uh, opening, uh, um, I, I think that there is nothing new about this slide. All of you probably already heard that software is eating the world and every company is a software company and, and software is the future. But this slide is not about something new, it's, it's just kind of uh, waking you up this morning, asking you, daring you to think about one thing in life, one simple thing in life that has nothing to do with software. We got to a point, our generation, and we should be grateful to live in this era that see the change, that, that witness the change. We got to a point that there is nothing in our life that has no connectivity to software. I live in the Silicon Valley, Three months ago, PG&E, the electrical uh, company, pushed a software update to the grid. There was three hours of darkness. This is essential. It's not even about our computers, iPad or iPhone. It's about powering our, our home and, and in the Silicon Valley. So, um, so it's everywhere. But the, the, again, nothing new about that. Unfortunately, just a bit more than a week ago, we got a very sad reminder of how critical it is. You all heard about the Ethiopian Airlines. Um, unfortunately, 170 passengers um, sacrificed their life a day after the Federation and Boeing announced that the failure was a software failure. And 
and the, and the solution is software update. Now, think about that. Over 500 Boeing Max um, aircraft were grounded. 170 people died because of software update. This is how critical it is. And when Jennifer is speaking about um, how reliable what we do should be, it's, it goes to the, to the bottom of everything we do in life, to safety, to, to families, to, to friends, everything you do. But let's put aside the, 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 the drama uh, and, the, and the unfortunate uh, um, event that happened last, last week, and this is from, from the newspaper, March 11, as you see. Let's, let's think about other, other stuff in life. Um, do you have Tesla in, in Australia? Or, or not? Do you have Tesla, right? So how many of you think that Tesla is a car manufacturing company? Thank you. How many of you think that Tesla is actually a computer on wheels? Exactly. So how can it be that in 2019, you cannot start your car if there is a software update? And this is from, by the way, it's not me. This is from their support portal. You cannot start your car. So you can drive to San Francisco, enjoy your Tesla, park in the garage, go with your wife to see a movie, and when you are back, you have to tow the car back because <laughs> that's, uh, that's the most sophisticated car in the world. So if you, if, you follow, if you follow the news and you see how essential what you guys are doing is for the basic day-to-day -day task that we have, your basic daily experience, you start to understand why it's so big. And the addressable market of DevOps today by analysts is $13 billion in 2018. End of 2018, $13 billion addressable market. This is nice. But it's big because last year when I uh, delivered a talk called The Future of DevOps, the same slide had a different number. It was $6.5 billion just a year ago. Now, if you think about how this market is growing so rapidly and so fast, it's not about replacing other tools. It's replacing methods, and it's replacing um, homegrown solution and sometimes label. This is what we do. We automate everything, we escalate everything, we want to do it faster and we replace what used to be part of our experience 40, 30 years. But don't, don't trust just the number. Let's look at what happened in 2018. So if you look at what happened in 2018, this is, this is phenomenal. Last time it happened was 30 years ago and companies that were born in such a a revolution starts a, a ground-shaking events, and I call it the, the, the tectonic plates are moving in the enterprise software world. Companies like Apple and Microsoft got, got you know, established. So what happened? In three quarters, more than $60 billion in acquisition. Red Hat to IBM, CA with Broadcom, GitHub with Microsoft. This is not another half a billion dollar acquisition. This is $34 billion acquisition. Everything that IBM, and it's public numbers, you can read it, everything that IBM had as their liquidity got invested in the future of the company because the world is changing. This is, this is more than just innovation or branding. In one quarter, in the last quarter of 2018, three companies that you guys know, GitLab, HashiCorp, JFrog, got funded with over a billion dollar valuation. So the market is not anymore the developer tools market. When we founded JFrog 10 years ago, there was no terms named J DevOps. We, we use all kinds of, of ridiculous terms like software acceleration, software automation, faster, and some of it we still use, release faster or die. Um, but it's now, it's more than mainstream. It's the darling of the enterprise software. And you see it all the way from Wall Street to, to the investors. And every company wants to be a DevOps company. But you guys did continuous testing and test automation 20 years ago. It doesn't mean that it's DevOps. 
Industry CEOs are stepping down, um, and, and, and it's not because they are not talented people. Most of them are people that I look up to, uh, but the industry start to be a bit more mature. And investors, public investors or private investors, are waiting for the results. It's not enough anymore to raise in a billion dollar valuation and not to deliver and not to build a business around it because the technology is mature enough. And if you are not ready or if you cannot step up with your business and create a business out of it, someone else will take it and there is zero tolerance to that. So you see public company CEOs being removed from, from, the, from their seat because they didn't deliver what was expected in such a booming, uh, such a booming uh, industry and market. It's a hybrid world. Uh, you know, funny, funny story, three years ago we raised our Series C. It was uh, 2016. And uh, maybe we were naive, but uh, part of our pitch was that the world is amphibian, you know, frogs, amphibian, we thought it's funny, nobody laughed, nobody, <laughs> nobody got our sense of humor there. But what we really wanted to say is that Everyone needs to have a solution that can run if it's self-hosted or if it's provided as a service in the cloud. We as vendors, we as providers should not decide for you what is better for your organization and what is the transition that you have to, to walk through in order to, to establish your DevOps solution. So um, back then we got a lot of crazy answers like, uh, you guys are missing the cloud movement. Uh, you, you, you don't see what happened in the market. And I said, well, we are the only company that started with the cloud and on-prem. It's not that we don't, we just think it should be hybrid. And three years after, we raised our Series D on October last year. Three years after, we are coming with this pitch. I removed the joke with the amphibian. I called it a hybrid from, from the first presentation. And everybody said, yes, that's the future, yes. AWS is doing it with VMware. Yes, Microsoft is doing it with Microsoft. Yes, um, <laughs> GCP, Google Cloud, is doing it with Cisco. Hybrid is the future. And, uh, and the last thing, and this is shocking because I'm coming from the community. I'm, I'm, I actually, I shared it with Igor last week. Uh, I, I had a talk in um, investment banking uh, a conference. I, I couldn't wear this outfit. Um, it was with a tie, button up, and, and normal shoes. Um, and I couldn't use the, the following words. Binaries, artifacts, Kubernetes. The only thing I could say is cloud, cloud, cloud. <laughs> and, uh, and here with you, I feel at home because we are coming from the community. We have built JFrog by, with, with with the community and, and answering the, the pain of the community. But it's funny now that every company is saying, oh, we are a developer first approach company. Um, if you heard Satya announcing the GitHub uh, acquisition, the first thing that uh, was out there was Microsoft is a developer first company. And by the way, Satya is amazing. Like what this guy did with Microsoft, whew, like, Microsoft was the easy to hate company, and now everybody likes Microsoft. But it doesn't mean that it's a developer first company. If it's a developer first company, you have to think like a developer. You have to build something that is the pain on the developer. You have to make developer life easier because all the weight kind of shifted to the left. The runtime will always be the runtime, but shifting to the left is, is the, the right approach. So, if so far we agree about the facts and there, there is nothing to agree about, this is just what happened, then I think you will agree with the following statement that we use in JFrog that life is the new runtime. I will let you process it for a moment because um, it's, not about, it's not about the fact that everything we do has something to do with, with software. It's about something else, and this is why you guys are sitting here. It's about the fact that in the past 10 years, and specifically in the past five years, we are not 
pushing software into life. Life is pulling software. And that's a big change. That's a big change. And, and just to make my point, how many of you are using Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, any of them? All of them? OK, all of you. Great. Does someone in this crowd know what version of Facebook you use? No. Because you don't care. You don't mind. You just want it to, to happen in the background. Life is the new runtime. And we pull software every day. And it will be even more um, significant and part of our integral part of our life with the next generation. If you ask my daughters, they don't even know what I'm talking about. They don't even know. They, don't, they, they just don't remember the days that they had the media to download the software. And this is what we call in JFrog uh, the liquid software vision. This is, this is why we created JFrog. This is more than just managing your binaries. This is more than just um, managing your CI, CD pipeline. This is where the world should go through. Software updates should run into pipe like, like water runs through pipes. And it should be a seamless process that, that happens in the background, and everything we do, everything you do, happens in the background until it breaks. And the same thing, you open the faucet, there is water flowing, you don't ask questions. If there is no water, you break the wall, you get to the pipes. This is the JFrog vision. Now, I'm, I am JFrog CEO, so one slide about JFrog. Um, we are a, a company of 400 frogs, nine locations, seven countries, six products. You guys probably know um, JFrog Artifactory, uh, um, the universal DevOps solution. Everything we do is universal. Um, People might call us the Switzerland of DevOps or the database of DevOps. Um, and, uh, and we started, like a lot of other companies, with an open source solution. Um, so we see ourselves part of the community and, uh, and the community champions. OK. Are you ready to leap in? You all sleep. <laughs> OK. Are you ready? Uh, OK. OK. <laughs> Thanks. So uh, what I've asked my team to do is to, to build a survey that uh, will be shared with all of our customers. We have 5,000 customers worldwide, all kind of verticals, all kind of uh, use cases, different tool stack, different pipelines, different generation. The, the, the diversity there is amazing. And I wanted to share with you uh, some of the results of this survey and to go back to speak about why next year you will see 90% of the companies using DevOps methodologies as their number one uh, challenge uh, in the enterprise software. So uh, you might think that uh, there, there are some blockers here, and, uh, and you're right, because uh, in, the, in the next 12 months, you will, you will face the following four trade-offs. And, and you are already, probably already, start to deal with it, okay? Or your organization. First one would be uh, unification of the process. Because you cannot allow yourself to have a DevOps process running in group A and another DevOps process running in group B. This is why you start to see unification and consolidation of pipelines. Organizations strive to build the right mechanism to manage this uh, software automation. You will deal with speed versus security. And, and I think that uh, Jennifer touched that. The, this is one of the most challenging uh, paradox or trade-offs in the DevOps life, uh, because by default, you are here because you want to do something faster. But, uh, but do it fast and dirty, or, or the slide that Jennifer presented, the agility versus productivity, and the developers have the reputation of, it's okay not to be responsible, it's okay to be cool, it's okay to push whatever vulnerabilities we want, it's okay when you release once a year. It's okay when you release once a quarter. It is not okay in 2019 when you release seven times a day and when you build a thousand times a day. And it's not even you. It's part of, uh, of the machine you use. Uh, the best of breed versus an end-to-end -to -end solution. Um, how many of you already kind of heard this question? Should we have an end-to-end -end platform or just assemble a puzzle of DevOps? Okay, you will. <laughs> um, and the limitation of choice, because we live in, in the containers world, 
and, and technology, it's nice, but it's all part of my containers. It's all part of my image. It's not something that I invest a lot in thinking about. So um, diving in, the unification, oh, sorry. Uh, the unification of, uh, of the process. Uh, you probably heard about uh, foundations that were established by the community and by companies, big companies, with only one goal. Let's unify what we are doing. You want to map metadata? Let's agree about what it means to map metadata because when you use open source, when you use public repositories, when you use the community wisdom, you should rely on one standard that is, that is aligned across the board. Now, it starts the friction start to be even more challenging when you see big companies with thousands of developers pushing different methodologies. And this is something that no organization in the world can allow itself, especially if we, the, the vendors behind the DevOps tools, kind of aligning ourselves to, to the standards that the community asks for. Ask yourself why a week ago, two weeks ago, um, the Continuous Delivery Foundation was announced. Ask yourself why the CNCF is so, so uh, successful and pushing um, the standards in the open source and the cloud native world um, to be standards and not just innovation happening in the community and the cool developers. There is huge responsibility that we are carrying uh, with us. Speed versus security. Um, here is the story. The developer is sitting on the left side and building software. The CISO is sitting on the right side a moment before it goes to the runtime, sitting on the gate that has the keys to push it back and to roll it back on the developer. Now, in my perspective, this is bullying developers. Like, nobody cares what you do. We will check it at the end. If, it's, uh, if, if you put the organization in a vulnerable position, then we will push it back to you. And you know what? Go from the start, build it, test it, and send it back so we that are sitting at the, at, the, at the gate a moment before it goes to the world, we are the protectors, we are the guardians of the organization, we have the authority to push it back on you. This was, this is the mentality, if you look at most of the security tools in the market, this is, this is the mentality. You scan the code, you scan the, 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 the process if you want, and there is someone with the hand on the, on the switch that can switch off everything and push it back on you. And it's okay, maybe it's even, even legit when, when you do it once a year, twice a year. I still remember uh, use cases uh, like we had in Oracle that Twice a year, they push software in the Fusion project. 60 terabyte was packed together. Two months, hands off, nobody's touching the code. Just testing, security, um, all kind of audits, all kind of compliances, and then uh, releasing it. But when you do it seven times a day, it's impossible. And the guy that starts to be miserable is your CISO, that starts to ask, okay, so how can I get off the developer back and walk with them through the pipeline and scanning the moving pieces and not the, the result of it. Everybody knows what it means to scan a code repository. There's nothing new about that. How can you scan an image, a Docker image? How many of you guys working with Docker already? All of you, great. So you all know that there is no one in this room that just walk with Docker. If you walk with Docker, you probably have some kind of a, of a Debian package in it and a Maven or, or, or .NET package in this Maven. It's a, it's a big Russian doll. And you have to open it and to scan it and to look into four or five different tiers and to give the developers the visibility to the dependencies that comes with the open source libraries that they are using and everything has to happen while you are building and pushing. So at the end, you are going to be proactive, saying, this is broken, I cannot push it to the next gate. Or even better, your Jenkins 
or your, or your team city or bamboo or whatever you use will break the build because there is a license compliance issue or there is a vulnerability issue. And there is one thing that you cannot compromise on how fast you do it because it's, it's very easy to release once a year and to be super secure. Very easy. But then you lost all of your competitive advantage because all of your competitors are, are releasing several times a day or several times a week. The next uh, uh, paradox that uh, you guys will face this year is the best of breed uh, or an end-to-end -end solution. Now, what does it mean? This whole methodology, this whole best practices came from the community made by developers for developers. And developers think differently. They don't think as the CIO that comes 20 years ago and say, uh, we just signed a deal with IBM and we are going to use WebSphere. How many of you guys worked with WebSphere? <laughs> Any IBM employees here in the crowd? <laughs> We hate it. We hate it. Why should I work with WebSphere if JBoss and WebLogic and all of these other tools are so easy to use and make my life much more efficient? So the days of your CIO comes to you and, and pushing some kind of a platform from a big vendor that he had uh, a wine and dine ceremony last night doesn't, doesn't work anymore, doesn't scale anymore. So you build a machine with the goal that he throw on you, we need to be faster. My ROI is measured by how fast I am. And you build it. You build your, your pipeline, you build your CI CD, um, you looked at the different solution in the market, you adopted technology super fast, and, and you build it in a best of breed mode. And now it became a bit more mature and you need the SREs philosophy and the SLA philosophy and you need some vendors that can stand behind your scalability. So you look at the end-to-end -end solution as well. And, and there is another thing. It starts to be kind of broken because if you remember the, the first paradox of unification, it starts to be broken because everybody needs to integrate with everyone and, and you just want it to work. And if this plugin is not maintained by this vendor or by the community, it starts to be has an hassle. So you start to look for an end-to-end -end solution. But still, the DNA we carry is the DNA that we want the best of breed. So the end-to-end -end solution that you see coming now in the market are end-to-end -end solutions that are open to whatever happens uh, around, around the specific solution. What, what, do I, what do I try to say? I'm trying to say that even the best platform that provide you all the tools should be open to whatever integration and customization you want to have. That's the, the combination of best of breed with end to end. Now, it's not that I thought about it. This is what you guys answered to the survey. You basically said, I want to have Zero limitation of choices, okay? In average, in average, everyone here in the crowd uses at least six technologies when, when you build your software. And without asking, I will tell you that you use Docker and you use NPM, you use either Maven, Nougat, or, or Ruby. You use PyPy for scripting. All of these moving pieces need to be, need to be managed, but you don't want to be limited. You don't want to be limited. You want it to work in one pipeline. You don't want to have your Maven repository and then to move to your NuGet repository and then to move to your PyPy repository and then to have your Kubernetes registry or Docker registry. You want to have one tool that supports them all. You want to have one Jenkins that can build and, and track and, and provide you with the visibility and the automation. You want to have one chef or puppet or Ansible or Kubernetes to deploy your software. And the limitation of choice got even to, to a different level when we entered the, the era of containers. It's by default, 
the technologies that we are adapting are universal. So you don't want to be limited. You don't want a vendor to tell you, um, we build this software for you, and it will support everything you do in Java. I, I don't care. I don't really care. I, I want to do it with Java, yes, but I want to do it also with NPM, and I want to do it with .NET, with NuGet, and I want to do it with 10 other technologies. I don't really care. I, I'm not expecting you to be the, the vendor behind the, the Maven builds or the vendor behind the Docker technology. I'm expecting you to provide me something that works with everything I do. Limitation of choice goes to um, a different level when we speak about the cloud. And if you remember, we spoke about the hybrid world. You want it to be hybrid, but guess what? You also want it to be multi-cloud. So thank you very much, Mr. Bezos. But I also want to work with GCP, and I also want to, to, to deploy on Azure. And in the world of Kubernetes, I want to do it with the same scripting and the same tools. I'm not going to build something that works with Amazon and something that works with GCP, or something that's supported in region A or region B, and if you cannot cube your, your, um, your regions to be ready to what I'm doing, then I'm moving to someone else. I want to have zero limitation of choices. It's the democracy of the development world. I'm not going to choose you because someone chose the technology for me. I'm going to choose you because you provide me with the freedom of choice. So this is about the, the paradox, the different paradox and the, and the trade-offs that you guys are going to face if you are not already uh, in the next 12 months. But uh, we also ask you, what are the technologies that you are using? And, and how heavily you adopted what we called the, the next generation of uh, DevOps, or the current generation of DevOps. And this is, what, uh, this is what you answered. The first thing about technology, I, by the way, I was surprised, I was surprised of how fast technology disrupted the market. Now let me explain. The rise of Kubernetes in my world, around me, my friends, my colleagues, my partners, disrupted the market so hard that it killed six different companies. Completely removed them from the future of an IPO public companies. One technology pushed by the community. And, uh, and if you think about um, the adoption here of Docker, the technology, and Kubernetes together, and you all remember the, the big argument between Docker Swarm or, or Kubernetes, and go back, take a step back to, to the paradox that I shared with you, to the trade-offs that I shared with you, and think why Kubernetes won. It's easy. Just look. It's, it's there. You said it. And if you look at the Kubernetes adoption and the Docker adoption, and we are going to speak about it in a moment, what, what you see here at the, at the, at the left hand of, of the deck is something that 10 years ago I wouldn't be able to present because it would be all about the big vendors' technologies. It was Sun Microsystem with Java. It was Microsoft with, uh, with .NET. Each island has... Is on, is on technology, and see how fast it's being adopted when, when the community is pushing it and when developers are adopting it. So you might think that, uh, that you know, there is enough time to take decisions, and, uh, and we shouldn't think about cloud native now, because why thinking about it? There are so many solutions in the markets. 80% of these solutions are not cloud native ready. And when we ask you, do you think that cloud native is important for DevOps? 80% answered yes. Eight out of 10 answered cloud native, critical for the future of DevOps. And then we ask you, okay, so I'm, 
I want to provide you, JFrog comes with six different products. We have one platform. I can manage your binaries all the way from your Git to your Kubernetes. Is it good enough? The answer was no. I want to have maximum flexibility in how I customize my CI CD pipeline. And 70% uh, of the people we asked, and remember, the, this survey was sent to 5,000 customers. There's, the, the diversity is, is to the roof. There is no one part of the world that think uh, this way versus the other. 70% of you said, we still want to customize our solution. And if you think about it, and this is the, 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 the argument that JFrog is pushing from day one, everything we do comes with an open REST API. So, so your life, when you customize your solution, would be as flexible as you can. And when I mentioned before that not every automation test company is a DevOps company, it's not because of the tools. There are awesome tools in the market. It's because of the DNA. If you cannot allow developers to have maximum flexibility in how they customize their, their environment, then by default, you are not allowing automation. And it might be right from business perspective, and it might be right from other perspective, and, and I saw what happened when AWS forked Elastic um, a month after Elastic went public. And I, and I see what happened now with MongoDB and, uh, and, and AWS. We, we, we all have, we, we see the evidence in the market, but if you really want to provide something that answers the developer's pain, you have to open it to a full automation uh, uh, um, uh, abilities. So we asked about hybrid as well, and uh, I, I think that we, we make the point here already, but uh, everyone, Everyone today want to have some kind of a solution when they, when they, when they build their software and deploy it. Now, um, hybrid is, is, is tricky because I don't think that any of you know uh, a startup that will start today and will build their own racks and servers and, and, and will do it like they did it 20 years ago. We all start in the cloud. We all deploy in the cloud. All of our assets are in the cloud. So the future is kind of suggesting that the cloud will be there. But we also know that we want to have an on-prem assets. We want to manage stuff the way our organization need it and not the way the, the, the community trend is. So the hybrid solution comes together with the, with the freedom of choice uh, that you mentioned. And this is the most amazing result we got in the survey. This is the Kubernetes adoption. 50% of you said, I'm already using Kubernetes in production. But it was not enough for us. So we asked, okay, so if you are not, when do you think you will use Kubernetes? And, and what you see, to make it short, what you see here is, is that 90% of the market, in two years from now, will use Kubernetes. 90% of the market. Now think about all of the methodologies of, of the other scripting deployment tools, and, and there are great companies there. Think about the migrations from this company. Think about the migration from technologies and tools that you use now to um, an orchestration tool like Kubernetes, to a multi-cloud solution, to a multi-region solution, to build once and provision everywhere solution. And, uh, and you will understand why we have to move faster than ever before. So 90% of the market, two years from now, will, will base uh, some of their production on Kubernetes. So if you collect all these pieces of data that I shared with you, I think that what you heard the, the community saying, yes, that's the fluid, that's the liquid software, but it cannot be, and it shouldn't be, served by, by chaos. And currently, we are experiencing a big chaos, a lot of question marks in the air. And, and we are striving to take this chaos to move to the creativity phase and then to order. And then it will start again, because we are disrupting the industry so fast with the technology. Chaos, creativity, order. Chaos, creativity, order. So 
Next challenges are, are the big five. One, we want you JFrog, we want you um, Vendor to give us with the unify everything solution. And, uh, and it's not just about the tool, it's also about the methodologies. The second thing, please provide us with a solution that is not breaking my build at the end, or sorry, not breaking my, my release at the end, but breaking my build at, at the beginning. If there is a vulnerability, if there is a license compliance issue, please let me know while, while, while I'm building. Don't let, me, don't let me wait two months and then understand. We want to maximize the choices and we are not willing to compromise. We want to have an end-to-end -end solution next to a best-of-breed solution, not versus a best-of-breed solution. And we want the cloud to work for us, not us working for the cloud. The cloud is here to make our life easier. It's not here to make, us, it, to make it more complicated. And my last slide is uh, the, the statement that I started with. By 2020, less than a year from now, I think that uh, all companies will be DevOps companies, not software companies, because of the following. The first thing that you see is the consolidation of tools. You start to see companies like Travis, and we acquired Cheapable, uh, announced it two, two weeks ago, and other companies that have CI, CD, solution within the solution. Consolidation already started. Atlassian came out with Bitbucket pipeline because you want it as part of your Git repository. And GitLab has it with their platform. JFrog has it with, with our platform. All the cloud have all of this solution. Consolidation of tools started. You want it to be a secure pipeline. You don't want to have a different solution for your CISO and a different solution for your VP of R&D. The second thing is what I call the delicated uh, DevOps. You want to push power to your different groups of developers. And this is being done by what we see and we call super DevOps. Small teams, very lean, provide DevOps services to the rest of the organization. Our customers at Cisco, a team of 10 people, support 4,000 developers. Provision their environment, from a portal they build. In the world of Kubernetes, in the world of the cloud, in the world of the self-hosted solution, this is the experience you want to, to, to share with your developers. You see super DevOps start to delegate DevOps. It's not anymore the dev and the IT world, it's the world of provisioning, provisioning your, your environment um, on demand, and when you don't need it, we kill it. I think that uh, all of you heard about uh, PagerDuty, uh, Fider S1, um, and, and in 2020 we will see at least, well, from, from, from the companies that in, in my zip code under the radar, um, I see at least three potential IPOs, pure DevOps IPOs, okay? Pure DevOps, not, not dev, not infrastructure, but DevOps. Uh, I think that uh, there is good chances that we will see uh, IPOs coming in, 20, in 2020. And we will have a much more aggressive freedom of choice. This is a sign that I should finish, huh? <laughs> uh, we will see uh, a much more aggressive demand from, from the market, from you, to have unlimited solution in terms of, uh, of the technologies, integration, tools that are working together, um, because otherwise vendors will lose uh, their competitive, uh, competitive uh, advantage. Um, speaking of, of the advantage, the, the market cap of DevOps predicted for 2020 is $25 billion. So again, analysts are talking about doubling the market size every year, every year. And I think that uh, without any kind of uh, high-level drama, I'm grateful and, and I hope that you are to be part 
of what I see as, as a revolution. You guys are the agent of, of this change. And, and if we push it, we will replace things that were not replaced for the past 30 to 40 years. In the 80s, there was a need for operation system, and, and Apple and Microsoft were born. In the 90s, with the, with the internet, Yahoo and Google were born. Social media brought Facebook and LinkedIn, and this is the era of the people that are sitting here. We are the, the change drivers, and the world of uh, liquid software is happening with or without JFOG, just to stay humble here. Liquid software is not JFOG vision, it's everyone vision. And I'm grateful and honored to, to be part of it and to be part of the community. Thank you very much.